Part 5, Pre-Tribulation Rapture? Simply, who has the feet? I believe that it will be most helpful to the reader if we preface our look at the rapture teaching with a good biblical perspective. A perspective is defined as a view of things in which they are in the right relation. Since the rapture doctrine relates to the body of Christ, it will benefit us immensely if we look at what the Bible teaches about Christ's body in relation to its head. When writing to the Ephesian church, the Apostle Paul uses the example of marriage to teach a symbolic principle of the church. He states, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Ephesians 5.23 He also states that Christ is far above all principality and power and might and dominion and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body. Ephesians 1.21-23 In Colossians 1.1a, Paul writes, And he is the head of the body, the church. These verses of scripture clearly reveal that Christ is the head of his body, the church. If Christ is our head and we are his body, it appears logical to assume that we have feet. Have you ever seen feet connected directly to a head? Of course not. Feet are attached to a body. This sounds pretty silly, I grant you. Nevertheless, this simple truth has profound implications when the rapture of the church is studied. Paul ends his letter to the Roman church with this very powerful and encouraging admonition. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. Romans 16.20 Again, it is clear that we are the body and the possessors of feet. The day will come when all enemies are put under our feet. And what will happen when that occurs? Christ will return. David proclaimed, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand, until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Put them under your feet. Psalms 110.1 In Hebrews 10.12-13 we read, But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting, waiting, till his enemies be made his footstool. What is Christ waiting for? He's waiting for his bride to mature so that all enemies can be put under her feet, the feet of his body. According to the word of God, until this is accomplished, Christ will wait or remain in the heavens. Acts 3, 20-21 is very clear on this point. It states, And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heavens must receive until the times of restitution, restoration of all things. So when does the Bible say that the end will come? Paul revealed this mystery to us in 1 Corinthians 15, 24-25. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. And this very simple discourse, the concept of a pre-tribulation rapture of the church has been dealt a very severe jolt. As we proceed and define rapture theology, its historical origin, and its consistent opposition to our Lord's teachings, this doctrine will hopefully be put in its legitimate context. How can Christ return for his church and still have enemies wreaking havoc on the earth? Remember also that the seven-year tribulation theory, Ribera's theory, has been completely annihilated. When we examine the rapture teaching, John N. Darby will again appear in a preeminent position of responsibility. Darby had many serious flaws and limitations. It would be foolish to ignore these, just as it is foolish to ignore major teaching flaws of any minister. Their words must be put to the fire, not necessarily their lives. I am not attacking men of God, only what men of God have erroneously proclaimed as God's truth. Alexander Rees very eloquently described the type of judgmental attitude which must be active in the church. We are commanded to execute righteous judgment. As the Mayflower pilgrims were about to sail for the New World in 1620, John Robinson, in his address to them, lamented that the Reformed churches could go no further than the instruments of their Reformation, Luther and Calvin. 
he urged them to receive whatever light or truth should be made known from God's written word. It was not possible, he added, that the Christian world should come so lately out of such thick anti-Christian darkness, and that full perfection of knowledge should break forth at once. The prophetic darkness of today must be eradicated through a process of restoration. An ever-reforming church was the cry of our Reformation fathers. Even so, Lord Jesus, reform and restore quickly. Reese went further and used Darby as an example and a warning. Then it must be said that Darby experienced the danger that comes to every teacher of the Bible. The temptation to be original to discover and give out things not previously seen, to be wise above that which is written, to speculate and be fanciful. We all do it. The imperfection of the human mind and its tendency to err or be fanciful are sufficient explanation. I have tried to abide by this above stated premise. I am not teaching or revealing anything new. Barbera taught us new things, Darby taught us new things, Christ revealed to us true things hidden from the foundation of the world. It is my contention that the rapturous doctrine opposes our Lord's teachings about the harvest at the end of the age. This flaw alone disqualifies its validity.